<laughs> and uh, anyway, so the problem is the Big Bang people, maybe more than half a dozen years ago, and uh, on the airplane on the way down there, I was from Northern California, I was thinking, you see, that the Big Bang people take non-existence for granted. They want to get the universe out of non-existence. I don't think that's possible. I have a button here that says nothing doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, I thought uh, there is this problem. And so uh, I was going to ask this question to uh, William Kaufman, but Alan Sandage, who used to run Palomar and took over after Hubble, he gave a very nice two-hour talk on the Hubble constant. Uh, he said, <laughs> I want it to be 42. He says, so the, so the Big Bang can go. I want it to go. <laughs> At any rate, he gave a very nice two-hour talk on the, on the Big Bang, and all the way through, he referred to the Big Bang as the creation event. So at the end, I got up and asked, since we're now willing to talk creation event, and I wiggled my fingers like this, why must we assume that in the absence of the universe and in the absence of space and time, there would be nothing? Isn't it unwarranted? To me, it's warranted that in the absence of time, we have the absence of change. That's warranted. And in the absence of space, we have the absence of dividedness and the absence of smallness. Dividedness and smallness are space problems. Change is a time problem. I said that leaves the possibility that behind what we see might be the changeless, the infinite, the undivided, which to me seems a long ways from nothing. <laughs> that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> He was not going to talk on it, and I wasn't going to hassle him. <laughs> but years later, Hawking gave three lectures at the University of California in Berkeley. I got into the first two. I couldn't even get into the third. I couldn't get near enough to the campus to park my vehicle. <laughs> when he first came out, uh, they, first they gave him the Wheeler Auditorium. That's 750 seats. It was filled up right away. And the people that got to the overflow did it on the run. The next time, they gave him a 1,200-seat auditorium and all the others for overflow, and they were all filled up. The third time, I couldn't even get near the campus, but I could see there must be at least five or 600 people out in the court who couldn't get into any of the buildings. Anyway, the first, the first lecture, he wasn't going to take questions, but I got to, to have the opportunity to ta ask him a question outside after the lecture. So I'm to ask him a question answerable by yes or no. So he's in his wheelchair out in the sun, and I'm down on my knees, and it was very, very sweet. He's doubled over in his wheelchair with his hand on his machine. When he first came out on the platform, he said that whereas for, formerly he couldn't talk, now he, they made him this machine, and it was made in, uh, in, in what do you call that? Oh, down this peninsula from San Francisco, anyway, a little ways, Mountain View, Mountain View, down the peninsula from San Francisco. So he got a big hand because it was made in Mountain View. Then he said, the difficulty is that he gives me an American accent. <laughs> <laughs> then he got clapped her. Anyway, so I, was, I told him, I was very apologetic, I told him that in order that my question could be answerable by yes or no, my question will be lengthy. And I told him that whole story about Alan Sandage and myself. And I asked him, do you see any observational evidence on one side or the other, whether behind what we see might be a zero, or whether it might be the changeless, the infinite, the undivided? He took the trouble to have his machine answer me. I'm not sure it's a meaningful question. <laughs> That's his way of saying no. <laughs> if he saw the evidence, he would have said yes. He doesn't see the evidence, so he answers politely. 
But I see the evidence. Gravity is the evidence that the undivided is behind what we see. Electrical, the electrical charge on the itsy bitsy particles is the evi observational evidence that the infinite is behind what we see. And inertia is the evidence that behind what we see is the changeless. They all show in what we see. Now it would be one thing if they had some other explanation for these things at Caltech, but they don't. The reason we send you all to high school before we let you go to the universities is so that you will all be polite. And none of you will ask the professors why the books fell to the floor. The professor has no idea why books fall to the floor and does not want to be quizzed on it. <laughs> now Richard Feynman is very careful after telling him what we do know, he tells what we don't know. That we know how matter behaves <coughs> under the influence of inertia. We do not know why it shows inertia. <coughs> we know how it falls in a gravitational field. We do not know why matter shows gravity. And as Einstein said, we cannot understand on, uh, on, on, on theoretical grounds. We cannot comprehend on theoretical grounds why matter should appear as discrete electrical particles. Why do the itsy bitsy particles have to be electrical? Why do the moving bicycles have to coast? And why do things have to fall? That's what I think is the change is the infinite, the undivided showing through. It shows in us also. We have a department of the government. <laughs> <laughs> You see, the changelessness shows through. Our yearning for the changes shows through. We, we, after peace and security, as I said, we have a department of the government. And the infinite shows through. We run after freedom. And the undivided shows through. We run after love. But you see, the genetic programming pulls the wool over our eyes and has us run after these things in ways that get the genetic programming done, job done. But something happened to us that didn't happen to the chimps on the beaches of Africa a long time ago. Something happened to us that didn't happen to the chimps. And that's divided our genetic programming into three batches. A few million years ago on the beaches of Africa, we elongated our childhood. And if you elongate your childhood, you elongate your parenthood, okay? You can't have a long childhood without having a long parent. <laughs> So we have these three batches of programming. We have a whole batch for being kids, a whole batch for being adult, and a whole batch for being parents. Now the prime directives of the genetic programming are twofold. Direct a stream of negative entropy upon yourself by eating and breathing, and pass on the genetic line. These are the prime directives of the genetic programming. Keep yourself alive and well by eating and breathing and pass on the genetic line. Now, children don't do either one. <laughs> Directing a stream of negative entropy upon ourselves and on our children falls on the parenting batch. Passing on the genetic line falls on the adult batch. And neither of them falls on the kids. <laughs> so you see, we have this very interesting way of looking at this world. We can see the way, well, let me put it this way. I have a kid, he's 16 years old. He's got a few more days before he's 17. I told him a few years ago, all kids know that grown-ups are nuts. Watch it, it's going to happen to you. <laughs> But we do have the opportunity, you see, and we all have the memory of it, even after we get older. We all have the memory, at least to a certain extent, of how the universe looked like, how the universe looked before we got so stupid. You can laugh if you like. <laughs>